We are delighted that the newly appointed Minister for Government Services, Consumer Affairs and Public and Active Transport, the Honourable Gabrielle Williams, can open our forum today. I'd like to welcome all mayors, councillors, MAV reps, council officers and transport professionals from across Greater Metropolitan, Melbourne and beyond. This is the third MTF Loves Buses Forum and it's being again conducted in partnership with the MAV who are providing the venue, the view, and lets us include councillors and officers across Victoria as well as other stakeholders via live stream. A little housekeeping. In the unlikely event of a fire, please use the stairs to exit the building. Don't use the lifts. Follow the person wearing a yellow orange helmet and proceed to the park over Albert Street. There's a beautiful park there which we can gather in at the corner of Albert and Nicholson Street. The bathrooms are located more or less in the, in the corridor, in the common area there. We have an exciting program today with local and international speakers, including leading edge academics and people with hands-on experience in designing and implementing change in public transport networks. We will have a lunch break from 12.30 to 1.15 and aim to wrap up by three o'clock for the school pickup. We're running today's session both online and in person and online attendees are encouraged to put their questions in the chat and we'll aim to get as many questions as time permits. So I'd like to welcome everyone who's watching online and hope you enjoy the proceedings as much as we do. Uh, we've got filtered coffee, but you've got something in your own fridge, so um, we, we hope you enjoy the day. It's wonderful that Minister Williams can, can be here today, and I'd like to say a few words about her before she speaks. Before entering Parliament, Minister Gabriel Williams was a project manager for the Office of the Vice-Chancellor at the University of Melbourne. Before that, she was a lawyer and advisor in both state and federal governments. Gabrielle was prompted to run for Parliament because she has always had a strong sense of justice and wanted to be part of a driving a socially progressive agenda, which makes our state inclusive and fair. Gabrielle's vision for Victoria's future is that it is a safe, vibrant and inclusive state that continues to lead the nation in gender equality, prevention of family violence, First Peoples, State Relations, Innovation and Economic Prosperity. The areas of public policy that she is most passionate about are prevention of family violence, gender equality, Aboriginal affairs, education and industry and employment. So I'd now like to welcome Gabrielle Williams to the stage. Please make her welcome. Thank you very much for that very warm uh, introduction, Jonathan. And before I begin, please let me also acknowledge the tra traditional owners of the land on which we're currently meeting, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders, uh, past and present, and any other First Nations people we may have here with us today. Um, and not to say those words out of habit, but always to reflect on the journey that we're on here in Victoria on our path to treaty uh, and what that means for all of us uh, and delivers for all of us um, uh, as we walk that path with um, our First Nations um, people and communities who've so very generously share their culture uh, and their vision for what we can be as a nation with us. I also, uh, of course, want to thank uh, the Metropolitan Transport Forum and, and the MAV for the invitation to speak here today. It is uh, wonderful to be able to join the forum in what is one of my first engagements as the new Minister for Public and Active Transport and a number of other portfolios, as, as you've heard as well. And I'm really critical, I'm really thrilled to be working with you on such a, a critical uh, issue uh, and one that I know is important uh, and close to the hearts of probably everyone in this room and many outside of it, um, being not only public transport reform but bus reform um, in particular. And I was saying um, just before and chatting before this event started that um, I think it's a prerequisite for anyone taking over this portfolio from Ben Carroll that you have to uh, you have to share his enthusiasm for our bus network and for our bus reform and that's um, no easy feat because he brought a lot of energy and enthusiasm um, with him to, to that role and particularly to um, his agenda for bus reform for the state which is something that I very proudly have inherited and think I can champion with the same level, level of enthusiasm that he has um, over the years. Um, look, I wanted to make a few comments about that, about the journey that we've been on and the journey that we've got ahead of us, if you could indulge me in that for, for a few minutes. 
Look, depending on how you cut it, Melbourne has already overtaken Sydney as Australia's largest city, and that fact will be beyond doubt by the end of the decade. By the 2050s, it's estimated that we will be home to about 9 million people, so the size of London today. And international experience tells us that cities with populations larger than 3 million uh, depend on extensive public transport networks to retain their livability. We've seen Sydney, cities in the world that have, um, uh, that have heeded that maxim and we've sadly also seen the examples where it has been ignored. Uh, and that's why we're really keen uh, to make sure that we continue making record investments in our public transport infrastructure, whether that be through projects like Metro Tunnel or through our level crossing removals, through our line, line upgrades, suburban rail loop. It's a very long list. But it's also uh, equally as important that we continue to invest uh, in, uh, in public transport services and connectivity as well. And buses will be critical to servicing the transport needs of that 9 million strong population and we need to get ready for that. The Victorian government has so far invested about $550 million um, since we came to office in new, more frequent and also extended service routes uh, right across our state. And on average, we've added about a dozen new routes uh, every year. That amounts to about 20,000 new services in just nine years. Since the launch of the bus plan a couple of years ago, more than 200 bus routes have either been improved or added to the network, and we've recently added more than 1,000 new bus services for staff and students attending Deakin University, including expanding coverage across the weekends, and we've also added about 460 more services in Fisherman's Bend, increasing evening services and weekend frequency as well. That's on top of delivering a new bus service. On top of delivering new bus services, though, we're also focused on building a, a better bus network. So, what does that look like, though? What does a better bus network look like? And there's a few things that I've um, I've listed when I've had to turn my mind to this in the early stages of of coming into this role. But firstly, I think a better bus network means better bus information. Because the era of bus stops with printed timetables is long over and that's why we're trialling rapid running, which effectively means throwing out the timetable and, and cracking on with delivering as many services as possible in the time available, which, mean pa which effectively also means passengers aren't kept waiting while buses sit idle. A better bus network also means more frequent services. Low frequency, we know, is a deterrent to getting on a bus and we're creating a turn-up-and-go rail network, so it's important that we do the same with buses. A better bus work, a network also means more bus priority. If we can get bus travel times more competitive with private travel, we can get more people on board. It's as simple as that. Bus lanes and bus priority at intersections are proven methods for cutting travel times uh, and a, as such a very important priority. A, bus, a better bus network also means a better customer experience and that's why we're trialling new solutions like FlexiRide, uh, which don't have a fixed route, as many of you will be familiar with. And since December 2020, FlexiRide has been introduced as a trial across Victoria, in, uh, in particular in newly emerging growth areas and where regular bus services might not uh, yet be as efficient. So we're trialling those services in, in Roeville, Lilydale, Murrelbark, Croydon and Rosebud. And we've also introduced them in growth areas like Tarnit North and Melton South, which means we can modify them or indeed replace them with fixed routes as that demand uh, increases over time. A better bus network also includes easier ways to purchase a ticket, and there's been quite a lot of coverage about this um, in recent months. Over the last few years, we've rolled out improvements to Mikey, like Instant Top Up and Apple Pay in the PTV app. Um, with a new ticketing contract beginning on the 1st of December, we'll progressively be adding new features to make sure Victorians can easily transition to more convenient ways of buying a ticket. We'll gradually add extra tap and go payment with credit and debit cards, payment using uh, digital watches, for example, and payment using digital wallets or on smartphones as well. We'll begin testing these new features from 2024 with a progressive rollout across Victoria. So customers will still be able to purchase and top up Mikey, uh, their Mikeys at, at train stations and retail agents, 
um, as well as through online services and over the phone, as they always have while we move through this transition to increasing um, the usability and capacity of that service as well. So um, it's not going to be a switch on, a switch off, switch on. Uh, it's going to be incremental and it's important that we do it that way to ensure that we're bringing the community with us on this journey. Of course, everything we do to improve the bus network, though, also needs to be done with a view to reducing and ultimately also eliminating carbon emissions. Transport contributes about a quarter of Victoria's greenhouse gases. We're making sure public transport leads the sector in reducing emissions and introducing new technologies along the way as well. We can run out trams and trains on renewable energy. We already do that. Making buses zero emissions, though, I think is uh, well understood to be quite a different challenge. That's why for the last two years we've been undertaking Victoria's first zero emission bus trial. It's the first step towards completely decarbonising the state's bus fleet and ensuring that all new bus purchases from 2025 can be zero emission. As part of the trial, there are 52 battery electric and, and two hydrogen low-floor buses in the metro and regional fleets. Seven hybrid buses and 56 new low-floor buses will be introduced across 74 smaller regional routes by the end of this year. And by mid-25, we'll have, we'll have about 89 zero-emission emission buses uh, servicing the network. So getting those zero-emission buses up and running has given uh, Victorians a chance to see and experience what is um, pretty wonderful new technology, but we also want to use the opportunity to boost Victoria's transport man manufacturing and automotive electricity supply sectors as well along that journey. Importantly, building zero emission buses locally presents opportunities to be able to expand jobs in this industry, growing industry uh, capability and introducing innovative technology solutions as well. We've got an opportunity to make ourselves here in Victoria a real leader in this field, uh, not only nationally but internationally too if we play our cards right. Of course, managing a transition of this scale and mag magnitude is a, is a pretty significant undertaking and we're decarbonising one of the largest heavy vehicle fleets in Victoria essentially and we have to ensure the infrastructure and workforce is there to support that transi transition and also that new technology that is coming along with it. Uh, my predecessor, uh, Ben, released the Zero Emission Bus Transition consultation paper earlier this year, and it set out our approach to that transition. Hopefully um, many in this room have had a chance to look at it. And it has a real focus on how we can best sequence the steps that we need to take uh, in order to achieve uh, our, our goals. There are a number of questions that can only be answered by working closely with the bus industry and its partners. I think that's pretty, pretty logical. Questions on the best technology, which technology best suits a particular application, what infrastructure is required, and what software systems are needed for that successful uh, zero emission bus operations are just some of those questions. And we also need to ensure that whatever we decide, that the solution caters to small regional operators as well as our larger metro operators too. And to get those answers, We've gone to the people uh, that, that have the knowledge and experience in running buses and in running zero emission technology in particular. Of course, uh, the trial has already generated a mine uh, full of information uh, on the many of the, of the opportunities and challenges that uh, this transition presents us. We've learnt something of, of the time, cost and complexity in upgrading electricity supplies to depots, for example. We, we've learnt how uh, a zero emission bus's lower operating costs can help offset the upfront capital expense as well, um, something that Treasury is always very interested in, of course. We've also learnt how much uh, training drivers and maintenance staff need to adapt to those new technologies and we've learnt how passengers are uh, enjoying the quiet and smooth experience because we've been getting some really great feedback on that front as well. So the information that we're harvesting during this trial is uh, hugely valuable to the way it will continue and the way that we can enhance this work over time across our network and across our state. So far, those zero emissions buses are collectively saving around 80,000 litres of diesel monthly. And importantly, the cumulative saving has come to nearly 1,000 tonnes of CO2 so far. The consultation paper was a call to bus operate, operators to the broader bus and zero emissions industry and the Victorian community about how we can best support Victorians bus operators through each phase of this transition. And I can't stress enough that the success of this transition is dependent on all of these parties, all of us, working together. 
So I want to thank everybody who responded to that consultation paper and made a contribution, particularly the MTF, and I know m many others who will be in this room today. Your input uh, means a better outcome for customers, for the community, for industry, and of course for the environment as well. And it also means that we are in, uh, in the process of building a much better network that will serve Victorians for a long time to come. This is a very future-focused uh, piece of work. We're amid a, a historically significant expansion of our PT network here in Victoria and have been undertaking that over, over the last nine years. We're also facing, though, the greatest challenge of our time in, uh, in, in averting climate change. Uh, not just Victoria, obviously, it's a, global, it's a global challenge. But public transport will be a key component, not just in reducing emissions, but ensuring our city retains its legendary livability. And that's not lost on me as Minister. It's certainly not lost on our Cabinet either who, particularly as we embark upon uh, a significant housing agenda and, uh, and planning agenda around how we better plan communities, as a part of that need to be ensuring that our transport network is a key part, to, uh, part of that overall story as well and a key part of ensuring that our communities, as we grow, continue to be livable, continue to be convenient. Um, well, in, in, I say continue, but really more so. Um, we're trying to increase convenience, increase livability, ensure that we can um, service the needs of our community by connecting people to the services and the life that they um, ultimately want and deserve. And so it's no small challenge, but I do feel like with the, the agenda that we've um, embarked upon, particularly with our housing and planning work, that we are given a new... Uh, a new breath of life, I guess, too, into the public transport reform agenda that we're embarking upon, too. We've got a new context in which to sell our wares, a new um, context in which we can really highlight um, not only the value um, of, of this sector more broadly, but also um, its contribution to how people enjoy their lives each and every day. Uh, and that uh, is a very exciting place to be, I think. A better bus network will make a really big contribution to meeting those goals. We all know it has certain advantages over other modes of transport uh, and that it's been something in Victoria that has arguably um, not lived up to the promise that it has and it's incumbent upon governments in partnership, of course, with all of you and, and many out there who um, have a great interest in this to be making sure that we... Um, that, that we do make it live up to its promise uh, in, the, in the time ahead and align it with those other um, key government agendas and community agendas as well. So thank you for being a part of this um, discussion and for pouring your passion and enthusiasm into these conversations. I know how um, grateful my predecessor has been over the years into having your knowledge and interest and input, uh, and I know that that's um, something I'll really value in the time ahead as well as we continue conversations that will um, sometimes be defined by their challenges, but I hope uh, will also be um, uh, propelled by the enthusiasm and, and, and shared objectives that ultimately sit at the heart of this. So thank you very much for allowing you to be here today and um, look forward to getting to know you all a lot better in the, in the time ahead. So thanks. Thank you so much, Minister. Your enthusiasm shines through. Uh, you, you are in uh, an enthusiastic